Welcome to church, everybody. Would you do me a really big favor and help me to say hello to all those who are at the beach or at the fishing camp or whatever. Come on, put your hands together. Welcome to church. We're glad you're here this weekend. So proud of you for taking time out on this holiday weekend to spend time honoring God and celebrating our freedom. As we said in worship, life isn't easy, but you know, the goodness of God is very, very real. And so I honor you for taking the time out to always worship and focus your attention on him. I want to encourage you today to go ahead and get that worship guide out that I mentioned earlier, or maybe grab your iPhone or whatever your favorite device is to write down some notes today, because we're going to jump right in to the Word of God today. If you've been with us for the last few weeks, we've been studying the book of Ephesians out of the New Testament in your Bible. And the book of Ephesians is just six short chapters, can read it about 10 or 15 minutes. It's very, very easy to understand. And it's a book that the Apostle Paul, it's actually a letter from the Apostle Paul written back to the church in Ephesus that he planted. And the, 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 the letter was written around AD 60, 64. So gosh, we're some 2,000 years away almost uh, from that season of life. But this is Paul's, the Apostle Paul's third missionary journey. And if you want to kind of read even more of the historical account, you can go to Acts chapter, kind of at the end of 18 and 19, kind of gives some of the historical context of what Paul was dealing with. Ephesus was a little bit like New Orleans. They liked to par Tay, okay? They like to pass a good time down the bayou, as we say around here, right? And uh, I enjoy that much for myself. I enjoy that about our city. And uh, Ephesus was a, was a city that was kind of the big city in, in their area, and a lot was going on. And what's amazing about it, and I've said this every single week, is how when the Apostle Paul planted a church there, how even in a place where people thought too many distractions, too much going on, too many struggles, the gospel flourished in the city of Ephesus and became a beacon for others. Mentioned many, many times throughout your Bible, even all the way to the end of your Bible, it's mentioned because God did something special there. And it's just a reminder for us that as we look back and we study chapter by chapter in this series, as we look back and say, oh, you know what, if God did it there, he'll do it here. Amen, everybody? Listen, the Bible is no respecter of persons. He's no respecter of places or times. If he did it, then he will do it again. Can I get a good amen, everybody, right? And so this is why the Bible is so important for our lives. Because the, the Bible isn't just a religious book, it's a historical account of God's interactions with humans, with mankind. And you can see the goodness of God from beginning to end. Yes, somewhere in the middle there were some challenges, there were some sin, there were some problems. But you see God's intentions in the beginning, and in the middle you see God's intentions when he sent Jesus, right? And in the end you see how God reconciles everything. This is throughout the entirety of your Bible and it really is in Ephesians chapter 3. We're in part 3 of the book. We did chapter 1, first week of the series, where we just simply talked about the Father's blessing. In chapter 2, we talked about how we all used to be some things, but God stepped in and changed our lives. Today's message I've simply titled, a little bit of a question, What's God's Plan? Pick it up, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. It'll be on screen. If you didn't bring a Bible or a device, you can look at it, read along with us. Apostle Paul says this, Ephesians 3, verse 1. When I think of all this, what is all this? All this is chapter 1 and chapter 2. If you've been writing a letter, he says, when I stop right now and I think of all this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the benefit of you Gentiles. Now, if you're unfamiliar, the Gentiles, the, the, you know, Paul was, he grew up a Jewish boy. And so a Gentile was anybody who wasn't a Jew. And so if you did not grow up with a Jewish heritage, that's you. The word Gentile could also be translated, you could even say just anybody in the world. Paul said, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the benefit of the world. Surely, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. He stops and says, I need you to understand something that all of this that I've talked about, I, I recognize that I am actually, I am tied with a chain to the administration of the gospel, that my entire life is about making sure the whole world understands what God's plan actually is and what God is doing right now. Now, if you've been following Christ for any amount of time, maybe you're just beginning, maybe you're even considering it today, one of the questions you're going to ask yourself 
No matter where you are, at some point in your life, you're going to say, what on earth is all this about? What on earth am I here for? And if God has a plan, is his plan for me to get in that car accident? Is his plan for me to lose someone that I love? Is his plan for me to go through? We can face all the... It forces us to ask some pretty challenging questions, doesn't it, right? Life presents enough problems, doesn't it, that you start asking bigger questions. Say, why, why is this happening? Well, the Apostle Paul is simply saying, I need you to understand why I exist. He's simply going to say in this entire chapter, this is my purpose in life. And I want to make sure that you all understand that that God is wanting me to administer grace to the world. How does the Apostle Paul then see the administration of God's grace being poured out. I'm glad you asked the question. We're going to answer that today. Paul gives us five areas of insight. And if you're reading along in the New Living Translation, it couldn't be plainer because he just says, God's this, God's this, God's this. He just says it very, very clearly. You're going to take some notes with me. The first thing he tells us about, number one, he says, I need you to understand God's plan. I need you to understand God's plan. Ephesians Chapter 3, verse 6, he says, and this is, come on, say with me, and this is God's plan. If you were wondering, did God have a plan, <laughs> Paul just says, I, I'm going to make it, I'm going to explain it to you as clearly as I possibly can. Both, both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to to Christ Jesus. Can I just time out right there before I read the rest of the verse? Paul is saying, I need you to understand that all of mankind is made in the image of God and all of mankind is being called to follow him. All of mankind receives blessings. Come on, there's no, as I said last week, there are no second class Christians, right? There are all, we are all first class citizens of heaven, regardless of your history, your heritage, or the color of your skin. Amen, everybody, right? That's what he's saying. And he goes on to say, by God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading the, say it with me, the good news. Number one, God's plan is, is for everyone to hear the good news. Y'all, y'all, some of y'all are going to say, well, pastor, this is going to feel so basic. It is. But the problem is when you walk out, you start looking for God's plan somewhere else in a different light, in a different understanding. God's plan is for everyone to understand. He lays it out clearly in chapter 2. What is the good news? The good news is that God sent his son Jesus on our behalf. We all used to be something else, but because of the grace of God, we are no longer those broken people anymore. He heals. He restores. He redeems. He forgives sins. We can enter eternity because of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the good news. And and, and this is what theologians refer to as the Great Commission. You'll find it in Matthew chapter 28 in the final words of Jesus. He says, "I'm, I'm sending you out. Go therefore out into the world and preach the good news. I, if I just said that to you, you would all say, well, pastor, I, I get it. That's, that's your job. You're the pastor. But what Paul is actually going to show us in this chapter is that we all have the same privilege as the Apostle Paul, that we're all called to do the same things. We have different job titles. We have different positions. We are in different places in the world and even in our city. But we all are living out as followers of Jesus Christ. We're living out God's plan. So if that's God's plan, how is grace being poured out? Number two, write it down. Grace is being poured out by God's people. Ephesians 3, verse 8. We're just reading the chapter verse by verse. He says, though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. You might want to underline or circle the word, the two words, endless treasures treasures. He said, I just, I need to tell you, I've got the privilege of telling you about the endless treasures. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. The apostle Paul says very, very clearly, God's plan is for you to hear the good news and for me to hear the good news, for your neighbor to hear the good news, for your city to hear the good news. And the vehicle for distributing that good news is you. 
Come on, say this thing. Say, God's called me. Say that with me real quick. God's called me. God's called me. God's plan is you. You say, well, you know, what's God's plan A? Well, God's plan A was you. What's God's plan B? It's you. He sent Jesus on our behalf, and, and we have the same privilege of telling the Gentiles, the world, about him. We are the primary vehicle by which God is pouring out his plan, his good news, into the world. We, we, we have the same privilege. You say, well, pastor, I, I'm, I'm a teacher in a public school. That's right. Administer God's grace as a teacher in the public school. Well, I, I'm a manager at Starbucks. Yep, well, administer God's grace and highly caffeinate the people of God. Amen, everybody, right? I always say that around here. Highly caffeinated people enjoy church more. And so today you either got coffee or, like me, you had a Red Bull before service, right? Y'all wondering where this energy comes from. <laughs> Sometimes I need, I need a little something extra. You say, well, well Pastor, I'm a, I'm a salesman. You know, people don't, may, not, may, may not like my profession. You know what? Administer God's grace. I'm a, I'm a CEO and, and I've got big things to do. You know what? Regardless of the product that you're creating and selling, God has called you, God's people, to share God's plan in the world. I think sometimes we get caught up in the position and the title so much that we miss the purpose that is present right where we actually are. And regardless of what God is allowing you to bring to people, you say, well, well, I go door to door and, and, and help people get AT&T internet. That just happened at my house recently. And so how, how do I administer God's grace? Well, fast internet is helpful. Praise God, everybody. But what's so much better is the way in which you give the product that you're giving, the character and the love and the care and, and the way that you actually carry yourself forces people at some point to say there's something different about you and maybe it's internet that was the vehicle that opened the door for you to actually administer God's grace. Y'all hearing this today? I think sometimes we disqualify ourselves. Well, I'm just a, you know, I, I work in this place and there, I work in construction. You know, people cuss a lot in construction. Well, I hate to break it to you, people cuss a lot everywhere. <laughs> when I was growing up, they used to say things like, well, they cuss like a sailor. And what I have found is that there are sailors everywhere these days. <laughs> God's plan very, very clear, you to hear the good news, and we are the primary vehicle that we're going to carry that good news into the world. Sounds awesome. Got it. Makes sense. It's not too hard to understand, but if that's God's plan and we're his people, why is he doing it this way? Number three, Paul says very clearly, I need you to understand God's purpose. God actually has a purpose his plan is connected with what he's doing. And I just love how he says it so clearly in one chapter. Hey, here we go, verse 10, God's purpose. Y'all see, this was like the easiest chapter of the Bible to preach, right? God's purpose in all this was, wait, come on, pay attention, don't, don't miss this. God's purpose was to use the church, not the building, not the organization, not the 501c3, no, no, you. God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. He said, watch, just like Job, you thought you were going to mess it all up, but watch how my people, according to my plan, display my wisdom and thwart everything that the enemy tried to do. Y'all hearing this, right? The book of Job is an incredible picture because the, the enemy comes to, to God and says, let me go in and mess up Job's life. And God said, you can try. But I, I promise you this, at the end of Job's life, he'll still be standing up and saying, all my life you have been faithful, and all my life you've been so, so good. The middle was tough, but the beginning was great, and the end was better. Amen, everybody. This is his purpose. He said, I just need you to, I'm putting you on display for the world to see. You wanted to be an influencer? Come on, everybody. You want your social media page to take off? Display the wisdom of God with your life. See, we the church are to display God's wisdom to the world. And when we live according to God's word, we are blessed. And God's wisdom is now being displayed in our lives. 
Can I just break it to you really, really clearly? We're either displaying his wisdom or the world's dysfunction. When people look at our lives, they're saying one of two things. They say, you're just like me. Well, you know what? As followers of Jesus Christ, we're not supposed to be like everybody else. We're supposed to be in the world but not of it. And they're flipping out and depressed and anxious and they're looking at you. And you got peace that surpasses all understanding. How does that happen? The goodness of God. The administration of God's grace. He's saying, that. yeah, I lost that, but I know the end of the story. You know, when you read the, when you read the end of the book, you know how it's going to end. You say, you know what? I can trust how God is going to work this out. So how you raise your kids, you're displaying his wisdom. How do you deal with anxiety where you're trusting God? How you trust God is on display to the world. How do you deal with sickness? Do you run to the hospital first or on the way there you say, come on, we're praying, seeking God. We believe God gave doctors wisdom, right? It's God who revealed to us how to do these things. Y'all, I feel like I'm preaching better than y'all are amening right now. But, you know, every once in a while I got to, you know. This, this property was originally a Presbyterian church. I think that spirit tries to jump on y'all sometimes. <laughs> love Presbyterians. Don't get me wrong. Love. Love. They just look quieter than me. That's all. He says, I, I, need you, I need you to know how you deal with your money. Is either displaying faith and stewardship and generosity. You're displaying wisdom or you're not. Your life is on display. And when we live this way, our lives are marked by number four. Just reading the Bible. It's marked by God's presence. See, the closer you are to really focusing your attention and your life to those first three points, the more likely you are to be just just enveloped by and empowered by and known by something is different when I'm with you. God's presence is real. Ephesians 3 and 12, because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. See, God's plan, people, and purpose are all working to make sure that we get into God's presence and we stay in God's presence. His goal is for you and I to start now how we're going to spend eternity. His goal is for you and I to begin to enjoy the benefits of our relationship. So many places in the New Testament, he says, I've given you a down payment of what it's going to be like there. And some of us, we're we're neglecting the down payment, so we're kind of wondering how good it's going to be there. Can I just tell you, the more time you spend in God's presence, the more you realize that heaven is a good gig, y'all. And I'm not trying to rush God's plan to get me there faster. I want I want him to take me as soon as he wants. But the day he takes me, throw a party in this house. Don't cry too much. Come on now. I know some of y'all might go through a season about nine months of mourning looking for another pastor. <laughs> Probably not. I know there, there's moments of sadness because we're just waiting for our moment to be there. But can I just tell you, I, I just believe so much that God's presence has been good now. How much, more, how, how much better will it be when I'm with him in eternity? See, God's presence changes everything in our lives. In the Old Testament of your Bible, as they were preparing the house of God and the temple of God, it's a beautiful uh, picture and symbol of what God wants to do in your heart and life. In the Old Testament, the structures were pictures of what God wants to do in your life. And what they would do in the Old Testament when when Solomon was building the original temple of God, there was so much order and detail in how he did it. There was so much detail in making sure they built it in the way that was honoring to God that when they took time to learn wisdom and use wisdom and honor God in the process of what he laid out, every single time they did that, both in the tabernacle and the temple, the Bible says that the Spirit of God showed up so strongly that there was literally in their time a physical cloud that could be seen. Now today, we've got artificial smoke makers up here, you know. They make the lights look better. Can I tell you guys very, very clearly today, That's all good to reach younger people. I'm a fan of it to be a generational environment. Let's be clear. The order of God brings the glory of God. And the glory of God can be felt and can be known 
and his presence can be real. You can walk into places and say, that wasn't just another church service. God was there. Actually, some years back, my, my pastor, we were, we were in a, a similar situation as One Hope and preaching the gospel in, a, in an elementary school, in a high school, and just people coming. And we were walking out to the lobby like we would always do, walk out to the lobby, just get, meet people, say hi. I try to do that as best I can and walk down. This lady looked like she had seen a ghost. Big eyes. When you see somebody looking like that, would you just stop and talk to them first, all right? A pastor said, you know, you know ma'am, how, are you okay? Is everything all right? She says, says, Pastor, there was something in that there room. I just remember, I just remember that, like, it wasn't checking the box. There was a leaning in and a sensing that God was there. Can I just tell you, I don't really want to play church. I don't want to pretend church. I want to know God is here. I want to know God is with me. And, and can I just tell you guys, I know God's plan. And I know I'm God's people just like you're God's people. I know God's purpose. And I, I know that everything he's asked me to do is telling me that I can't do it without him. Moses literally said, if you don't go, I ain't going. I know that's poor English, but I'm using it today. Every single time you can see that when we order things in a way that's honoring to God, his presence showed up. You may, like me, feel this way, but, but you know the job can feel overwhelming, right? You turn on the news. Have you, have you seen the world, Pastor? Yeah, I've seen the world. They're kind of angry at times. Feels a little dangerous. Every other month, one of my friends who pastors in another city sends me a message and says, Are you Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm okay. I'm just making sure you're not dead. What are you talking about? It's like, well, I just heard that, you know, you're like the number one or the number two on the most people. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I need you to understand that in a dark and dying and desperate world, God is still good. And God is a protector and a keeper. And God called me for such a time as this in a city just like this. If he did it in Ephesus, he'll do it here. Y'all hearing this, right? I'm not living in fear or frustration or worry. And so, yeah, the job can be hard. And so the Apostle Paul, I'll just take you to 2 Corinthians. This is his answer. He, he, He says, you know, I've traveled on many long roads. Many long journeys, I've faced danger from rivers and robbers. I've faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities and the deserts and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. Listen, Paul knew that we were living in a dangerous world. And yet he still believed that God was powerful enough to take care of him. See, God's plan can't just be about me, and God's plan can't just be about you. It can't be us four and no more trying to get into heaven. God has a clear plan. He's called us to do it. And so I think if the Apostle Paul were here, he he would probably want more of us to come together. He, He would feel the enormity of the task, but he would say to you, I need you to understand, number five, I need you to understand how much, how much power you've got to do this. I need you to see that God is powerful and mighty, that God's power is available for you to do the task. Some of y'all are are, are amused by this, maybe visiting family in this season, but uh, I'm born and raised here and had the privilege in 2004 to be a part of an amazing church plant in Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham, Alabama is in what we call the Bible Belt of the United States. New Orleans is not the Bible Belt. Y'all know that. Some of y'all were confused. We're below the belt down here. (laughs) That's funny in so many ways. It just is. And for almost 10 years, my wife and I were able to pastor there, do some incredible things. The church grew in amazing ways and presented some amazing opportunities for us to to continue, if you want to say, my career in in very great places. Job offers were, were present, and we felt compelled that God was calling us to New Orleans to start a church. No guarantees. We had to raise the money. We had to build a team, and we didn't know if anybody was going to show up. That was in 2014. But we had some faithful family sitting right here in the front row. We had some faithful friends that would come alongside. I remember aunts and uncles and cousins saying, we're praying for you. We believe in God's going to meet you, that God is powerful enough to do it here. We turned down very good paying jobs for one with no guarantee of a job. Why? 
Because God is powerful. Because God is powerful. And listen to the Apostle Paul's prayer. He says, For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be all the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And the church said, Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul says, in one chapter, God's got a clear plan. That plan is God's people. My purpose is for you to display my wisdom to the world so that all the world would be in my presence. And when you think it can't be done, My prayer is that you would know God's power today. God's power is available for you to make it through. Earlier in the book of Ephesians, he says his power is incomparably great. In Ephesians 3, he says his power is immeasurable. Incomparable says if I were a football quarterback and I threw the football... It's a little bit different than Tom Brady throwing the football, y'all know. It's incomparable how far I can throw the football and how far Tom Brady can throw the football. Y'all know this, right? By the way, we're similar in age, and he can throw the football further than me. Thank you for the three of you who thought that were funny. (laughs) Incomparable is one thing. Immeasurable, Paul says, God's power isn't just incomparable. When God throws the football, he throws it out of this world. His power is incomparably great to do all that he's asked you to do. So what should we do? Three things really quickly. In light of Ephesians 3, in light of God's plan, being his people, his purpose, his presence and power, what should we do? Number one, we should just work the plan. How about that? How about y'all? Hey, hey, y'all, how about we work the plan? How about we just, how about we just get in the game? How about we just say, I'm going to, I'm going to work the plan. I love it. It's not on screen, but it's, it's attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. He said, preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use, use words. Like you don't even necessarily have to become a preacher like me. You just need to work the plan, live the life. So what is your time? What is your talent? What does your treasure really say about you today? If your life was audited by God, would he say, you're living for my plan and my purpose? Or would your life be focused on your needs and your wants and your life? Today, I'm challenging you on this weekend to work God's plan. Secondly, Secondly, I want you to wisely display God's purpose. See, God's purpose is available to all of us. What does your life display? God's wisdom or the world's philosophy? Because even when you're not actually telling them, you're telling them. My wife, when we were early in ministry, she noticed something about me, and maybe because she, she knew me really better than other people, she noticed that I could be really, really disciplined about what I would say, but she would say my face was always saying maybe something other than what my mouth was saying. Y'all know anybody like that? She'd say, your mouth is saying God bless you, but your face is saying you're an idiot. And what she was saying to me is that I'm saying the right thing, but what I'm displaying is the other thing. And for now over 20 years of marriage, I've been working on my, my you're, you're not an idiot face, okay? Like, I'm trying to smile a little bit better and make sure that, that what I'm displaying actually goes along with the heart of God. All I'm saying to you is when you begin to work the plan, you're going to have to wisely display God's purpose in your life. 
See, the world wants to redefine everything that God has created. The world wants to redefine everything that God has created. But your family is the first institution that God created to display order. And as the family goes, the nation goes, and the world goes. Today we have incredible freedom. Let's make sure that our family is displaying what to do with that freedom. Work the plan and wisely display God's purpose. And here's the last as we close. We're going to walk in God's presence and power. When you do this, you're going to find that God is with you more often, that God's presence is going before you to make a way. You'll face challenges. You'll face dangers like the Apostle Paul says. But when you do, what you will find, like we found in 2014, that though the jobs look good in other places, God favored what we were doing here, right? Here we are coming up. September will be nine years of preaching the gospel right here in this city. You know, God has been faithful and God has been good and God has been powerful and God has been with us in every situation. Today, I want you to know that the more you do this, the more you're going to walk in God's presence. So as we close today, I want to encourage you to worship. I encourage you to pray. I want to encourage you to read your Bible. I want to encourage you to get in small groups to take next steps. Why? Why? Because God's plan is very clear. And we're in this together. Amen, everybody? Would you bow with me in prayer? With every head bowed and every eye closed, just for a moment. If today you heard something maybe you've never heard before, if today in this service you sense a hope that you didn't have before. Today, that hope comes from the presence of God. That hope is God's desire to bless you and to favor you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I won't embarrass you. I won't ask you to stand or come to the front, but if you're here today and you need to receive the good news in your life, you need forgiveness, you need to shed the guilt and the shame, and you need to lean into the purpose of God, today's your day. If that's you, would you whisper this prayer? Say these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm giving you my life. And I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior. God, would you forgive me for my sin? Would you forgive me for trying to live this life my own way? And God, would you give me the power to follow you all the days of my life? In Jesus' name.